Open our minds and our hearts to the message that you want us to learn, that we can celebrate and live in the hope and joy of what your son brought to us. And so Lord, speak to us this morning and mold us and shape us into the men and women of God that you've called us to be. We thank you again and we pray all of these things in Jesus' name, amen. All right, so as you're taking a seat, take your Bible or your apps or whatever you read on and turn to Isaiah chapter 9. Isaiah chapter 9. Now, Chad's already alluded to it. Uh, It's the beginning of December, which means we are in Christmas season, right? Um, And for many of you, it's the beginning of December, which means you've been in the Christmas season for two months now. And to you, I say shame on you. Christmas doesn't start until after Thanksgiving. That's my take, and I offended some of you, but I don't know. I just don't feel right about celebrating Christmas in the midst of October and uh, November. It doesn't feel right. So anyways, we are in Christmas. It is Christmas season. Uh, It's just a few weeks away, and so here's what I want you to do to start out. I want you to turn to your neighbor and tell them what you are most looking forward to this Christmas season. So turn to your neighbor and tell them what you're looking forward to this Christmas Okay, so I'm going to assume that most of you said either something along the lines of family, right? A lot of you, family's coming in, or you're going to see family, or whatever. You're getting your family together. Uh, A lot of you probably said food, uh, because let's face it, Christmas is an awesome time of year for food. Uh, There are two major food holidays in my family, Thanksgiving and Christmas, Uh, so, you know, I gained 10 pounds in in a month's time, just out of these two seasons. So family, food, uh, presents, uh, especially if you're younger, presents are a big deal. It's probably the only deal during Christmas season, right? Um, I had one guy last night said sleep, um, and I hadn't thought about it, but that's actually kind of a tradition in my family. Uh, When we we eat the afternoon meal, it's it's never lunch, it's more like two o'clock, Uh, that we actually get everything together and eat. And my family will consume so much turkey and food that it's unavoidable. You you make it over to one of the couches in the living room, and next thing you know, you've got five guys sprawled out, totally passed out in the living room. The football game is on, but nobody's actually watching it because they're all asleep. Uh, So, you know, I think there's a lot of truth in saying that sleep is one of the things that we look forward to at Christmas time. Um, you know, presents are a big one, especially with kids, right? Um, I have a four-year-old at home, uh, and right now we're doing the 25 days of books. It's our third year to do it. We're uh, Knox every evening uh, opens a book leading up to Christmas, and on Christmas Eve, the book that he opens will be about uh, the birth of Jesus Christ and what Christmas is all about, and we talk about it with him and, and have that discussion. But because we're doing that, um, every night, about five o'clock, The questions start. Dad, can I open my present yet? Um, Dad, can I take a bath early so that I can open my present early? You know, he he is so obsessed and consumed with getting that present, the anticipation of what book it's going to be and getting, I think it's more about just ripping the paper off. I don't know that it's the actual book, but the anticipation drives him crazy. And we all kind of bleed into Christmas with that kind of anticipation. I know for me, when I was a little kid, Christmas Eve was the most difficult night of the year. Hands down, hardest night, because why? I would be forced, you know, my parents had to urge me and force me to go to my bedroom and go lay down. And they would, you know, pull the Santa trick. You know, Santa's coming, and if you're not in bed, Santa can't come to the house because he knows when you're sleeping and when you're not, right? And so he would encourage me to go to bed simply because, or my parents would encourage me to go to bed simply by telling me, you got to get to bed or Santa's not coming. And so that was a big deal in my house. And so we would get to bed, but going to sleep was a whole other issue because I would lay down in my bed and my eyes would be wide open in anticipation of what was gonna happen the next morning. I remember years where I would be laying in bed and I would be shaking with excitement. But inevitably, 
because of this great excitement that was going on within me, I would wear myself out and within an hour I was dead asleep because I would just pooped myself out. And that's kind of the anticipation that we look forward to at Christmas, whether you're looking forward to family coming or, or the food and fellowship or the presents or, or whatever it is. We love this time of year. We love the anticipation and the buildup to this time of year. But let me ask you this question, kind of shift this just a little bit. Outside of the month of December, the other 11 months of the year, for some of you, the other nine months of the year, depending on how crazy you are about Christmas, outside of the Christmas season, what do you anticipate? What is it that you anticipate outside of Christmas? What is it that you look for? What are you looking forward to? So what do you anticipate? Where are you at with that? Well, we're studying Isaiah today, and Isaiah lived in an interesting time. Isaiah lived in the uh, 7 and 600s B.C. He was a prophet in the land of Judah. Uh, Now, at that time, in Isaiah's time, the nation of Israel had split into two separate kingdoms, the northern kingdom of Israel and the southern kingdom of Judah. And Isaiah lived in the southern kingdom of Judah where Jerusalem was located. And in Isaiah's lifetime, actually just within a decade of him being called into ministry by God, he saw the Assyrian Empire come into the northern kingdom of Israel and completely wipe them out and take all the survivors and scatter them all over the known world. Not a good time. Not happy anticipation. Not something that they enjoyed seeing. And the hardest part for the Judeans was that there were prophecies about the same thing happening to Judah. That some foreign empire was going to come in and also invade Judah and also destroy them and also scatter them across the world. And so Isaiah lived in a time where there wasn't a whole lot of hope. There wasn't a whole lot of joy. It was kind of a gloom and doom mentality among the Israelite people. And they didn't have a whole lot of good things to anticipate. They didn't have a whole lot to hope for. And so uh, God speaks into this because let me ask you this question real quick. How many of us go through difficult times in our life and we get into those gloom and doom state of minds. We go through difficult times and we struggle and we have a hard time seeing a light at the end of the tunnel and we kind of lose hope. And we kind of get in this mentality, this state of mind where we just don't want to keep going. We, we don't see any way out and we, we have a hard time even waking up in the morning because that next day is only going to bring more disappointment and more struggle. And that's what Isaiah's people were going through. But God gives them a really great message. So look with me in Isaiah chapter 9. Isaiah chapter 9. We're going to start in verse 2. Isaiah chapter 9, verse 2, and it says, The people who walked in darkness have seen a great light. Those who dwelt in a land of deep darkness, on them has light shined. You have multiplied the nation. You have increased its joy. They rejoice before you as with joy at the harvest, as they are glad when they divide the spoil. For the yoke of his burden... And the staff for his shoulder and the rod of his oppressor you have broken as on the day of Midian. For every boot of the trampling warrior in battle tumult and every garment rolled in blood will be burned as fuel for the fire. For to us a child is born. Now stop there for just a second. Let me ask you this. No matter what's going on in your life, When you hear about a birth announcement, isn't that usually good news? Yeah. But think about Isaiah's day and time. In Isaiah living in the 700s, 600s BC, he lived in a time when kids were pretty much the entire existence of a family. A husband and wife were expected to have many, many children. It was part of what being a family was all about. 19 kids and counting was the norm, not the unusual scenario. If you didn't have a dozen kids, then people looked down on you because that's what your job as a husband and wife was, was to populate, to have lots of kids. So kids were a huge, huge blessing. 
Outside of a marriage, there was not much that a town celebrated as much as the birth of a child. And so for Isaiah to say in chapter 9, all these things are coming, and to us a child is born, that by itself, without continuing on, was great news. But look at what else he says. Verse 6. For to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and of the peace there will be no end on the throne of David and over his kingdom to establish it and to uphold it with justice and righteousness from this time forth and forevermore. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will do this. Now we can look at Isaiah chapter 9 and know that the child that's being spoken of is the Messiah. It's Jesus Christ. This prophecy was made 700 years before Jesus was born. And so to them, to the people of Israel that Isaiah is speaking to, this is great news. This is exciting. This is massive to the message that they needed to hear. They needed to have some hope. They needed to have a message of joy. Through this prophecy, God gives them a new hope. He gives them new anticipation, something new to hope for and look forward to. So let me ask you this. Where is your hope? Where is your hope? What do you hope for? Because let's face it, life is not easy. And anyone who tells you otherwise is trying to sell you something, right? Life is not easy. Life is a series of ups and downs. It's good at times. It's difficult at times. And we need hope, especially in those difficult times. And the fact is, is the way the Bible talks about it is we choose whether to live in hope or in despair. You see, Jesus freed us from slavery. And let me paint this picture for just a second. When I say the word slavery, what, do you, what comes to mind? We think shackles. We think prisoners. We think of someone having control over someone else. And it's not in a good way. It's in a very negative way. Our sin kept us in slavery. But when we stepped into a life-changing relationship with Jesus Christ, that slavery ended. The shackles fell off and we became free. But as free people, we have to live in hope, not fear. Because fear will drive us down. It will hold us back. It will break us and tear us and eventually Fear will destroy us. It's the opposite of what God wants for our lives. So since he's freed us, we need to live in the freedom and the hope. Because if we live in fear, we're not truly living, are we? If we're always fearful and always worrying about the things that we see around us, we're not truly living. And we're actually being held back from the plans that God has for us. If we can't step out because we fear something or we worry about something, God can't enact his plans. We're holding him from being able to do what he wants to do in our lives. We miss out on what God has for us when we live in fear rather than living in hope. So instead of fear, we choose to live in hope like a child joyfully anticipating Christmas morning. Think about it for just a second. Christmas morning... You're a kid. Why do you look forward to and anticipate joy and happiness on Christmas morning? You're not guaranteed that you're going to have a great Christmas morning filled with presents, are you? It's not promised to you, but you can look back at last year and know that Christmas was one of the happiest days of that year. And you can look back at the year before as a child and go, and the year before was Christmas was one of the happiest days of that year. And the year before that, as a child, Christmas Day was one of the happiest days of the year. You see where I'm going with this? You can know that Christmas Day this year is going to be amazing because every year in the past it has been amazing. Experience has taught our children that Christmas Day is going to be one of the best days of the year because we teach them that through experience. 
But shouldn't we do that in our walk with Christ? Let me ask you this. When you stepped into a life-changing relationship with Jesus, did your life change for the better? Yeah. When you went through difficult times as a follower of Christ, you may not have seen Jesus walking with you in that difficult time, but when you got out of it and looked back at the difficulties that you were going through, you can almost always point and say, there was Jesus walking with me. There was Jesus holding me up. There was Jesus helping me and assisting me. There was Jesus encouraging me and supporting me. Even if I didn't see it in the moment, I see it now. So if Jesus has always been there for us, Every time we went through tough times, every moment that was difficult, Jesus was walking with us, why wouldn't we anticipate that Jesus is walking with us now? Why wouldn't we live in that hope and that joy knowing, even if we can't see him in the moment, knowing that Jesus is there because he's always been there in the past? Just like that child knowing that Christmas Day this year is going to be the best day of this year because it was the best day of the last year and it was the best day of the year before and the year before that. Shouldn't we know that Christ is with us because he's always been there for us before? Not only that, Jesus promises that he will never leave us and he will never forsake us. Jesus promises that he'll be with us. And so why wouldn't we, in the difficult times in our life, in the struggling times, why wouldn't we live in hope? Christ has promised, and he's always been there before, so why wouldn't he be there now? We should live our lives in that same anticipation and that same hope that Christ is always walking with us and helping us no matter what we go through, whether we can see him or not. Live in that anticipation. Live in that joy. So think about it for a minute. Why do we anticipate? Why do we anticipate? I have one word for you, Jesus. We anticipate because of Jesus Christ and what he has done for us. Because he's always been there for us in the past and he promises he will be with us forever. Think about John 3, 16 and 17. For God so loved the world. God loved all. All of us so much that he sent his one and only son that whoever believes in him would not perish but would have everlasting life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world but in order that the world might be saved through him. The fact of the matter is is that that is what Christmas is all about, isn't it? The fact that Jesus was sent by the Father to die for our sins so that we could be saved. That's what this season's about. It's not about Christmas trees. It's not about lights. It's not about decorations or presents or Santa. Christmas is about Christ. Christmas is about the birth, the birthday of the greatest man, God come to earth in the form of a baby. That's what Christmas is about. Think about what John 3.16 says. God sent his one and only son. I have one son. I have one child, a four-year-old boy. And I cannot even begin to wrap my mind and my heart around the idea of knowingly and willing, willingly sending him to die for someone. But that's exactly what God the Father did for me and for all of us. The fact is, is God sent his son. He was born as a baby just like all of us. He lived life just like all of us. And he lived a sinless life. He did not sin one time in his entire life on this earth. In his entire existence. And what did he get as a reward for living a sinless life? He died on a cross. As a perfect sacrifice for you and for me. For every person who has ever lived. So that we could be freed from the slavery that sin had put us in. That's what we celebrate at Christmas. We celebrate the birth of the one who came and saved us. And on the third day, he rose from the grave. He he rose in victory. He defeated death. And then he ascended into heaven. And he sits at the right hand of the Father. And he has sent us the helper and he walks with us and he helps us and he encourages us and he lifts us up continuously. That's what it means to celebrate Christmas and that's what it means to have a life 
life-changing relationship with Jesus Christ. That's what it means in this Christmas season. And if you have no idea what I'm talking about, if you've never stepped into a life-changing relationship with Jesus, you can do that today. And if you've got questions or you want to take that step, come see us in the room over here to your right after the service. We would love to have that discussion with you and walk you through that and tell you what the next steps are and help you understand what you're, what you're committing to do. And let me tell you very clearly that this is not about a list of do's and don'ts. It's not about following a list of rules. Having a relationship with Jesus is just that. It's about a relationship. I've been married for 10 years, just over 10 years. And I can tell you right now that I love my wife and I don't cheat, I don't flirt. I mean, let's face it, I could, I look good. I'm a beautiful man. Okay, now stop. Every service has laughed when I made that statement and I'm starting to really wonder deep down inside. It's a good thing I've got healthy self-esteem because right now I'm starting to wonder. But the fact is, is I don't cheat, I don't flirt, I don't mess around on my wife, and it's not because I feel like it's my obligation or duty as a good husband. I don't cheat on my wife or flirt with other women because I love my wife, period. I don't follow Christ because I feel like it's an obligation and it's my duty as a good Christian. I follow Christ and do what makes him happy because I love the man who came and died for me. I desperately love the God who came to this earth and lived a horrible life on this earth compared to what he had in heaven and died on a cross to save me from my sins. That's why I follow Christ. That's what I, why I do what I do is because I love him. And if you want to know more about that, come see us after the service. Because that's what Christmas is about. That's what Christmas is, is having a relationship with Christ and living in the hope and the joy that only he can provide. So I have a closing question for you. Something that I want to walk through with you uh, at the end of this message. The question is this. Are you living in joy or are you just enduring? Are you living in joy or are you just getting by or are you just making it? Because he can tell you right now, God does not want you to just make it. He wants you to live life. And as Christ put it, he wants you to live life abundantly. He wants you to be joyful. He wants you to live this life with hope in your heart. And so here are a few questions to help you really look at your life and understand whether you're living in hope or whether you're living in the despair that the world is throwing at you. And here's the first question. Do you live in the hope day in and day out that Jesus has given you? In other words, do you think about Jesus and God sometime during the day? Or is it something that you just think about on the weekends when you come to church? Is Christ ever a thought or an inkling that comes across your thought process anytime during the day? Or is it just something that comes across on the weekends? Do you live day in and day out choosing to live in the hope that Christ provides. Here's my second question. Do you live in that hope or has fear taken over your life? Have you allowed the difficulties of this life to snuff out the joy that you're supposed to be having? The joy that Christ openly gives. So here's what you need to look at. Look at your day to day you know, going and coming and going to work and, and going to bed and, and fellowship and, and hanging out with people. Is Christ a part of any of those things? Does Christ cross your mind? Does following him and the relationship you have with him ever have an impact on your week? Or are you letting fear, are you letting the worries of this world drag you down? And keep you captive from what God really wants to do in your life. My encouragement for you today is this. Let Jesus give you the joy you need. Let Jesus provide that joy. I would like to say that it could happen overnight. But it's usually not that easy. 
I went through a time in college when times were difficult for me. I, I struggled. Um, I had made a, a long series of really bad decisions, ungodly decisions, and those decisions had come back on me and were hurting me. They were, they were damaging my life because of the sin that I had committed in the past and was currently committing. And I can tell you that if I went to my apartment and my roommate was not there, I had a hard time holding back tears because I did not see any light at the end of the tunnel. I did not see any hope. I did not see any chance for joy to be in my life. I would wake up in the morning and just think, well, today is just gonna bring another series of problems and sorrow and difficulties. And I just didn't have anything there that I looked forward to. And I had a very good friend who loved me and had the courage to come to me and say, listen, you need to get out of this. You're not living in any hope. You don't have any hope in your life. You need to get out of this. Why don't you come to church with me? Why don't you come back? Why don't you start living your life for Christ again and let's get your life put back together? And again, I'd like to say it happened instantly, that overnight things changed, but it didn't. It took time. I had dwelled, I had lived in that horrible despair for so long that it took a while for me to get out of it. But it was only through the hope that was given to me through Christ that I did get out. I don't know where I would be today if that friend had not been placed in my life by God to come in and help me get out of that and steer my life in the right direction. I don't know that I would be standing in front of you today if it wasn't for that. But it was only through the hope of Jesus Christ that I turned my life around. It was Jesus working in me that helped me have hope again. And you can have hope, but you have to allow God to put that in your life. You have to look for it and choose, consciously make the decision that you are going to live in hope rather than in despair. So let Jesus do that in your life. Live in the hope rather than in the fear and the worry. Join me in prayer. Almighty God, I thank you so much for this time and especially for this season and what Isaiah chapter nine says. Thank you, Lord, that you sent your son to die for us so that we could have that life-changing relationship with you. Thank you for loving us that much. And Lord, I pray that today you would help us to live our lives in the hope, in the anticipation of the joy that you can bring. Help us to look for you day in and day out continually, looking to see where you're trying to plug that hope into our lives. So thank you so much. Thank you for your son. Thank you for what this season represents. We thank you again. We pray all of these things in the name of your son, Jesus, the, your son and our amazing, loving savior. Amen.